Tom Watson. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this has been a very passionately argued debate with over, as a, my count, 59 members giving speeches where they were not holding back. And the scene was set by the Honourable Member for Christchurch, who said at the start that the Prime Minister must accept the verdict of the House last night. And the necessity for that was underpinned by my right honourable friend, the member for Nosley, who highlighted the fact that she is a prime minister with no majority and no authority. Which is perhaps why the honourable member for Ross Sky and La Carpa talked about the PM's record level of a lack of humility. And the right honourable member for Twickenham, in what I thought was a thoughtful speech, spoke of the government's arrogant approach to these negotiations. Why is that so important? Because as my honourable friend, the member for Wallasey said, the UK is more divided and fearful for the future than ever before. Now, we have had some comic moments in this debate. I was particularly amused by the honourable member for Mid Norfolk's contribution, his Life of Brian speech, which is an homage to one of the greatest satir satirical far farces in British film history. Very appropriate for the times we are in. And the Honourable Member for Brentford and Ongar talked about the Conservative Party rebonding in the long lobbies tonight. Now, I can't, f I can't fail to note the passionate and sometimes breathless critiques of the last nine years of austerity economics my colleagues on my side of the House, particularly the members for Gedling, Ilford North, Warrington, uh, Warrington North, Hull West and Hessel. And a special prize must go to the Honourable Member for Dudley South, who at very short notice gave a four-minute speech in three minutes by speaking 25% faster. <laughs> now, Mr Speaker, as the Prime Minister said earlier in this, uh, in this debate, this is a crucial moment in our nation's history. But it is an unenviable task to summarise this debate today and to ask members of this House to pass judgment on her stewardship of our country. First, let me say very clearly that I am not one of those people who questions her motives. I agree with the Honourable Member for Stirling, who claimed she was motivated by public duty. I don't doubt that she has sincerely attempted to fulfil the task given to us by the voters in this referendum. I have no doubt, too, that she has tried her best and given it her all. But she has failed. And I'm afraid the failure is hers. And it's hers alone. And I'm certain that every member of this House admires her resilience to suffer the humiliations on a global stage that she has done would have finished off weaker people far sooner. Yet the reality is that if the Prime Minister really sat down and thought carefully about the implications of that defeat last night for our country, she would have resigned. Throughout history, throughout history, Prime Ministers have tried their best and failed. There's no disgrace in that. That's politics. But this Prime Minister has chosen one last act of defiance. Not just defying the laws of politics, but defying the laws of mathematics. And it was Disraeli who said, a majority is always better than the best repartee. She is a Prime Minister without a majority for her flagship policy, with no authority and no plan B. 432 to 202. Mr Speaker, that is not a mere flesh wound. <laughs> no one doubts her determination, which is generally an admirable quality, but misapplied it can be toxic. And the cruelest truth of all is that she doesn't possess the necessary skills, the political skills, the empathy, the ability, and most crucially, the policy to leave this country any longer. Now, I know there are many good people in the government, 
They will be examining their consciences as the clock rundowns on these Brexit negotiations. Because she has refused to resign, we now face a choice between a general election to sort out this mess or continued paralysis under her leadership. But now the ante has been raised. The government has been defeated on a Brexit plan that has been its sole reason for existing for the past two and a half years. It has not just been defeated on the most crucial issue facing our country, it has suffered the worst defeat of any British government in history. And the clock is ticking. MPs have shown that they're ready to take back control over what has been, from start to finish, a failed Brexit process. But the question facing the House tonight is whether it is worth giving this failed Prime Minister another chance to go back pleading to Brussels, another opportunity to humiliate the United Kingdom, another few weeks to waste precious time. Our answer tonight must be a resounding no. Yeah. And let me remind you why. It was this Prime Minister who chose to lay down red lines that never commanded the support of Parliament. It was this Prime Minister who refused to guarantee the rights of EU nationals who've made their lives and their homes in this country. It was this Prime Minister who time and again tried to shut Parliament out, refusing to give us a meaningful vote, refusing to release the legal advice to the deal. She's treated this place and its members on all sides with utter disdain. Yeah. Mr Speaker, it was the member for Gainsborough who said the road to tyranny is paved with executives ignoring Parliament. Yet that is what she has done. And so Parliament is having to assert its rightful authority. Yeah. And at every turn, she has chosen division over unity. She's not tried to bring the 17 million people that voted leave and the 16 million people that vote remain, voted remain together. She should have tried to assure those who voted remain. Instead, she chose to placate the most extreme of her colleagues on the leave side of the debate. That has left the nation more divided than it was in June 2016. Out on the streets, in homes, in schools, in hospitals, people are struggling and take no hope and no strength from this ailing government. What happened to those burning injustices she said it was her mission to fight when she came into office? Racism, classism, homelessness, insecure jobs. They've all grown and burned brighter than ever before. And for so much of this, she is responsible. If the House declares it's no confidence in the government tonight, it will open the possibility of a general election and a decisive change in direction for our country on Brexit, a decisive change in direction for workers, for young people and for our vital services. Mr Speaker, the Right Honourable Lady will forever be known as the Nothing Has Changed Prime Minister. But something must change. So our only choice left is to change her and her government in a general election. We know she's worked hard, but the truth is she's too set in her ways, too aloof to lead. She lacks the imagination and agility to bring people with her. She lacks the authority on the world stage to negotiate this deal. Ultimately, she has failed. It's not through lack of effort. It's not through lack of dedication. And I think the country recognises that effort. In fact, the country feels genuinely sorry for the Prime Minister. I feel sorry for the Prime Minister. But she cannot confuse pity for political legitimacy, sympathy for sustainable support. The evidence is clear. And I know that out of loyalty to party, members opposite will want to support the Prime Minister in the vote this evening. But everyone in this chamber, no matter which lobby they go through tonight, know in their hearts 
that this Prime Minister is not capable of getting a deal through. The members on the opposite benches know it. They know, we know that they know it. The country knows it, which is why we must act. That is why we need something new. That is why we need a general election. I commend this motion to the House.